When a card costs three mana of the same color, it tends to be pretty powerful. This is because such a card really makes it difficult for you to play more than one other color in your deck. And if you are playing more than one color, you still have to make some serious commitments to your mana base to be able to cast them. When it comes to cards that cost three mana of the same color, I think most players first think of cards that cost three black, since there are several all-time great cards with that mana cost. In this video, we'll look at the 10 cards that cost exactly three black mana that have left the biggest impact on competitive magic. This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. Use the links in the description to visit their store. Before we get started, here's a quick reminder on how I rank cards in these videos. A first tier top eight is worth two points. This includes events like Pro Tours, and a second tier top eight is worth one point. This includes events like Regional Championships. At number 10, it's Carevex Spite. For three black mana, and that's the last time I'll be saying that in this video, otherwise it'll get really repetitive, it's an instant that makes target player lose five life, and as an additional cost to cast it, you sacrifice all of your permanents and discard your hand. That is quite the additional cost, and it's something very fitting for a card that is triple black, since black is often about paying something to get something. A theme we'll see higher on this list, too. Anyway, obviously you can't really cast Spite unless it wins you the game, but that's exactly how it was used. It gained points in both block and standard as a card that provided important reach in games. Think of it kind of like a black Fire Blast, although obviously it's substantially worse than that card, since Fire Blast has you give up less and can be cast for free. Carevex Spite hasn't put up any top finishes since 1997. At number 9, it's Ayara, first of Lockthwain. She's a 2-3, and when she or another black creature enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. You can also tap her and sacrifice another black creature to draw a card. She found most of her success in standard mono black decks with a hefty sacrifice sub-theme. It was particularly spicy alongside Cauldron Familiar, which, when combined with Witch's Oven, can just come back every single turn and drain a life. If Ayara is in the mix, you end up draining two life each time instead. Ayara also has a single point from a Legacy Aluren deck. These decks are all about setting up a situation where you can just cast cheap creatures over and over again for free using Aluren and kill your opponent by doing so. Cavern Harpy is one of the best ways to do this since it bounces stuff, including itself, so you can just keep casting the Harpy with Ayara in play, which eventually kills your opponent. Ayara hasn't put up any top finishes since 2020, though. At number 8, it's Pox. This is a sorcery that makes each player lose a third of their life, discard a third of the cards in their hand, sacrifice a third of their creatures, and sacrifice a third of their lands, and you round up each time. In other words, this is a symmetrical card that can really dismantle both players' board states and resources. You might think you'd be the one to come out behind, since you're the one who has to fork over mana and a card to even make it happen, but there have been legacy decks built around breaking Pox's symmetry since 2008. These decks are loaded up with disruption like discard and land destruction, which makes sure your opponent almost always has to give up more than you do when you cast Pox. And then once you've made it so your opponent is defenseless, you can win the game with a recurring Nether Spirit or Cursed Scroll activations. Pox decks have never been at the top of Legacy, but they're still around, with the most recent major top 8 for Pox coming last year. At number 7, it's Necro Dominance. This powerful enchantment references an older enchantment that we'll see further up on the list, but more on that later. Necro Dominance is a legendary enchantment that makes you skip your draw step. It also limits your hand size to 5, and any time a card or a token would be put into your graveyard, it gets exiled. That's a lot of downside. So, what's the upside? Well, you can draw tons of cards, because at the beginning of your instep, you can pay any amount of life, and if you do, you can just draw that many cards. Obviously, the hand size restriction can limit how many cards you get to hold on to, but that's still insane card draw. Necro Dominance is from Modern Horizons 3, and that means the only 60 card formats it's legal in are Modern Legacy and Vintage. And despite being relatively new, Necro Dominance decks are making up a pretty hefty portion of the modern metagame and finding lots of success. The goal of Necro Dominance decks is to take advantage of all that extra card draw, and you can really do that by gaining a bunch of life with Shieldred. You can also pitch all of those cards to Soul Spike or March of Wretched Sorrow, which lets you gain even more life, and Soul Spike can even go after your opponent. When you can gain that much life, including by drawing cards with Shieldred, you can just draw your whole deck if you want to. Necro Dominance looks well positioned to gain more points in Modern, and it's even got a single top 8 in Legacy. 
At number six, it's Infernal Contract. This sorcery draws you four cards, but you also lose half of your life rounded up. So yet another triple black card that makes you pay a cost for a big advantage. And of course, it was always played in decks that could minimize that downside or even turn it into upside. Its earliest successes came in block and standard Pross Bloom decks, which were all about comboing Prosperity with Cadaverous Bloom. Prosperity lets both players draw X cards, and the Bloom lets you exile cards from your hand to produce mana, and you can see how those two cards can combine to the point where you just draw your whole deck. While Infernal Contract wasn't part of the combo, it was an important card at getting you set up and finding your combo pieces. Paying life in that deck didn't really matter, because once you started drawing tons of cards, the game was over. Infernal Contract has also seen some play in Legacy Death Shadow decks. These decks turn paying life into upside, as Death Shadow can be absolutely massive in the early game, and the contract ends up being an insane pump spell that also draws you a bunch of cards. However, Infernal Contract hasn't had any top finishes since 2018. At number 5, it's Sadistic Sacrament. This sorcery has Kicker for 7 generic, and it lets you search a player's library for up to 3 cards and exile them, and if it was kicked, you can instead search for 15 cards and exile them. This type of effect is kind of narrow, but in the right metagame, stripping key cards out of your opponent's deck can make it impossible for them to win. It's intermittently been a sideboard card in both Legacy and Vintage over the years, where it can be a particularly potent sideboard card against decks like Storm or Ad Nauseum that are highly reliant on one or two cards in their deck to go off. Sadistic Sacrament hasn't put up any top 8 since 2022, but it's hard to count it out entirely, since in the right metagame, it's a useful sideboard card. At number 4, it's Garolf's Messenger. It's a 3-2 that enters tapped, and when it enters the battlefield, target opponent loses 2 life. It also has Undying, which means that when it dies, if it has no plus and plus 1 counters on it, you return it to the battlefield under your control with a plus and plus 1 counter on it. In other words, for a total investment of 3 mana, you get a 3-2 and a 4-3 that makes your opponent lose 4 life. That's quite the return on your investment. It saw a ton of play in Standard, where zombie decks had tons of support. These decks often also used Birthing Pod and Mortar Pod, which could get some extra value out of Garolf's extra body. Garolf's Messenger has also been very successful in Modern. Initially, it was played in Jund mid-range decks that were all about generating two-for-ones, and obviously that's exactly what the Messenger can do. It was also a pretty sweet hit off of Bloodbraid Elf's Cascade. After the Elf got banned in 2013, though, the Messenger didn't have a home in Modern for several years. That all changed with the release of Modern Horizons in 2019. That set contained Yawgmoth, Thran Physician, which can combo off with the Messenger. If you use Yawgmoth's ability to put a minus one minus one counter on the Messenger when it has a plus one plus one counter, the two cancel each other out. And that means it can just keep undying over and over again. You do need another creature with undying in play, but as long as you have that, you can just endlessly loop the sacrifice effect that puts a counter on one of them until Garolf's Messenger's Enter the Battlefield ability lowers your opponent's life to zero. There are modern toolbox decks built around comboing off like this, and while the release of Modern Horizons 3 seems to have made this deck a lot less prevalent in the format, the Messenger is still likely to add to its score in the future. At number three, it's Bridge from Below. Some might not like that this card is here since it's virtually never cast, but hey, it costs three black mana. Nobody casts it because it only has an actual effect when it's in your graveyard. Once it is, you get a 2-2 black zombie token anytime a non-token creature is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, and if the bridge is in your graveyard and a creature an opponent controls is put into the graveyard, you exile the bridge from your graveyard. Obviously, this combines quite well with Sacrifice Effect, since you get another body for each of your creatures you sacrifice. It first saw play in extended Icarid decks, which rapidly loaded the graveyard using Dredge and other effects, so getting the bridge in the graveyard and reanimating multiple Icarids a turn was really easy. Because Icarid sacrifices itself at the end of every turn, if you had the bridge around, that meant you'd get a 2-2 token every time, too. While it was played in some modern graveyard decks over the years, it really rose to prominence in modern thanks to Hogak in 2019. Hogak both wanted cards in your graveyard and bodies on the battlefield, and the bridge is happy to be in the graveyard generating those bodies, and it really enabled you to get Hogak into play in the extreme early game. Ultimately, the bridge got banned in modern for making graveyard decks too good. However, it has long seen play in legacy and vintage dredge decks, and that's going to keep on occurring for the foreseeable future. The two cards in front of it are pretty active too, though, so the top three might be the best the bridge can do. At number two, it's Necropotence. Probably the first card that springs to mind when you think of something that costs three black mana, Necropotence is one of the most powerful black cards and one of the most powerful enchantments ever printed. It's also the card that the number seven card, Necrodominance, references. 
It's an enchantment that forces you to skip your draw step, and whenever you discard a card, you exile it from your graveyard. Those downsides are nothing, though, on a card with Necropotence's activated ability. You can pay one life to exile the top card of your library face down, then you put that card into your hand at the beginning of the next instep. So, there's a delay, but basically Necropotence can draw you as many cards as you have life, all for only three mana. Necropotence is a card that was famously underrated by people when it came out, as people just couldn't imagine the downside was worth it. People quickly realized they were wrong once they started playing with Necropotent since the card advantage it gave black decks made them virtually unbeatable. When paired with Dark Ritual, you could even get it down on turn one. This resulted in the summer of 1996 being called Black Summer because everyone was playing black to gain access to Necropotence. The dominance of Necropotence didn't end that summer though. In fact, the card was even more out of control by 2000 and 2001, so it was banned in Legacy and Extended and Restricted in Vintage. And it remains banned in Legacy and Restricted in Vintage to this day. Necropotence has actually enjoyed a bit of a renaissance since 2020, as Doomsday decks have become top tier in Vintage. These decks generally try to win the game with Thassa's Oracle, and Necropotence can help you out by helping you find your Doomsday. And you can also put Necropotence in your top 5 with Doomsday to get to the Oracle even sooner. So one of the top tier Vintage decks runs the one copy of Necropotence that is allowed. By the way, if you want a deeper dive on Necropotence decks, I have covered them in my deck history series. So. Necropotence is going to keep on helping Doomsday decks do their thing, and speaking of Doomsday, that's what our number one card is. The sorcery lets you give up half of your life to exile your whole library, apart from five cards, and you get to put those cards in whatever order you want. The other cards on this list all saw some play within a few years of being printed, but not Doomsday, which didn't start seeing play anywhere until 2010. For a long time, they're just wasn't a great reason to use a card that had this effect. I mean, what's the point in giving up most of your library and half of your life when you don't even get the cards right away? But starting in 2010, it became a really important card in the internal formats, where it has been an enabler for combos because it lets you make sure you're going to draw your combo pieces over the next few turns. In Legacy, it's been used in Ad Nauseam decks, and in Legacy and Vintage, it's been used in Storm. It's gotten a really big boost in both formats in the recent past as a result of the printing of the aforementioned Thassa's Oracle, since that is a card that goes perfectly with Doomsday, since you shrink your library and make sure you get the Oracle, which will win you the game with its Enter the Battlefield trigger. It's going to keep gaining points in the Eternal formats, and it's probably going to remain the number one card on this list for the foreseeable future. So, those are Magic's best cards that cost three black mana. Are you interested in spending three black mana for these powerful effects? If so, check out the description where you can find a direct Card Kingdom link for each card that was in this video. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe. If you want to catch up on past MTG Top 10s and other Magic content, you should see a playlist on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.